Howdy, folks. It's uh, Stan and Ken again uh, doing uh, our second talk. We had some pretty good uh, feedback and quite a few uh, views. Um, last time I looked earlier in the week, I may have texted you this, Stan, but we were well over 80 and climbing. So uh, have you had a chance to look at that? And from your end, uh, do you have you gone on YouTube to see the video? Our first yeah, one? <laughs> Uh, completed it, yeah. Okay, good. All right, so you see what's going on. All right, so that's great. So today, you know, I had suggested this topic because to me this is a huge one, and uh, I think it's 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 kind of at the root of what causes a lot of the problems in the world, and that's, you know, people are suffering a lot, and they're suffering a lot based on their fears, and this can have a mass ripple event because all consciousness is, is connected and the thoughts of human beings are what create events. That's, that's a pretty hard statement to, to disagree with, even on the most basic level of the physical plane. When you think about like-minded people get together, they create organizations and they, based on their beliefs and thoughts around all those organizations, they, um, create certain actions and certain events and you know that's a pretty simple thing to see in the course of of, of a daily life but i'm going to go to a deeper route on this with stan today and that's talking about on a deeper level how does that work uh and wh where does it come from that that thoughts create beliefs and, and beliefs create actions that ripple out into the world i want to read you guys a quote um i work a lot from the seth uh material which um started a long time ago it really kind of its roots are back in the early 60s uh long before most most people even heard the term channeling and stan and i talked about this i think a little bit last time but uh a lady named jane roberts um actually uh channeled an entity named seth and i know that might sound funny to some of you but uh this is extensive extensive material there are a lot of scientists who become in, interested in it. I went to a conference in uh, Chicago in 97. Uh, we're from here in St. Louis, Missouri, and there was a, a local physicist was there talking about how a lot of the properties um, in the quantum world that Seth has discussed and explained have led a lot of the physicists who've studied this material to whole new lines of experimentation and discoveries that have led to new technologies that we have now. It just the only reason I mention this is it's it, it adds even a little more credibility. There's so much material here uh, and some very interesting things have happened. It kind of redefines how things really work versus how a lot of us have been conditioned to believe that things actually work in the universe and how that relates to our daily lives. So I've got a, I'm going to read uh, some information here from page 233 to 235 in uh, the individual and the na nature of mass events. Uh, Jane Roberts channeled this for Seth. I'll hold this book up. There it is. Um, by the way, any of you folks get interested in this, they suggest this, they being other people who still work with and, and do things with this material that you want to do them in chronological sequence of when they were published because one book leads to the other and there are connections that are happening. As you go, there are exercises throughout the books that will really dramatically change your perspective on everything. And for me, what it's done is uh, the first noteworthy thing for me that it did was eliminate fear of death. And that's a big one for most of us, you know. <laughs> I, I, I think over the years, Woody Allen has always <laughs> ended up on that theme in one way or another in his movies. And it's just kind of echoing the psyche of the masses, you know, that people are afraid of dying. And if you can get past that one, it opens up a whole new world. Let me give you some, some food for thought here to kind of kick into this a little more. Um, this, here again, page 233 in this book. Uh, the, the very attempt to describe reality in scientific terms as they're currently understood pays undue, I'm paraphrasing a little bit just to shorten it a little, pays undue tribute to a vocabulary that automatically scales down greater concepts to fit its rigors. In other words, such attempts scientifically further compound the problem of considering a seeming, seemingly objective universe and describing it in an objective fashion. The universe is, and you can uh, pick your terms, a spiritual or mental or psychological manifestation 
and it and not in your usual vocabulary an objective manifestation uh, there's presently no science religion or psychology that comes close to even approaching a conceptual framework that could explain or even indirectly describe the dimensions of that kind of universe its properties are psychological following uh, the logic of the psyche and all of the physical properties that you understand are reflections of those deeper issues so that that right there starts giving you a hint about thoughts and beliefs creating reality each atom and molecule and any particle that you can imagine possesses and uh, would possess a consciousness so from that statement therefore that's the the basis for any new scientific theories that that would hope to accomplish any performances at all leading to an acquisition of knowledge um, our universe its its meaning its coherence and order um, come about because of of the realities that are partly obvious to us but on a larger scale because of the inner realities are the unspoken or hidden realities that most of us are not aware of. The universe is a psychological reality in which objectivity is the result of psychological creativity. So in our realm of reality, there's no real freedom, but the freedom of ideas. And there's no real bondage except for the bondage of these ideas. So your ideas form your private and mass reality. So you want to examine the universe from the outside to examine your societies from the outside. But all of the time, the psychological reality is the primary one that forms all of the events that we experience as humans. It's not to say that you can't understand the nature of the universe to some extent, but the answers lie in the nature of your own minds, in the processes of individual creativity, and in studies that ask questions like, where did this thought come from? Where does my thought go? What effect do, do these thoughts have upon myself and others? How do I know how to dream when I've never been taught how to do so? How do I speak without understanding the mechanisms of speech? Why do I feel that I have an eternal reality when it's obvious that I was physically born and will physically die? You may say these are unscientific questions, but Seth tells you that these are the most scientific of all questions that we could ask. So what we're talking about here is everything being consciousness, everything being energy, everything affecting everything else. And thoughts, groups of thoughts create a belief system. The belief system puts into, puts into action behaviors that create events so that's that's our premise that we're working with here so this meaning that people who are suffering in essence because they're creating their own reality based on their beliefs and thoughts are creating their own own suffering and and beyond that as the title of this book suggests in which it explains in detail how that has a mass effect so the idea of the saying that be careful what you think because it's affecting others' thoughts. And we, we, I mean, you can think of really basic mundane examples of how that works. You know, a convincing speaker, some of the evangelists that get up can make very convincing arguments for what they're saying and people begin to believe it. And before you know it, there's a huge gathering of people that believe it. And where this becomes dangerous are in little minor things such as uh, all those little things like World War II and the Holocaust. <laughs> you get a lot of, you get a convincing figure that shows you the power of even just one person and their ability to get their, to, to gather their thoughts in a way to create a certain belief system. And then that to take off through other people who, do, who choose, because they do choose to believe that and look at the horrible events that can happen from that. That is an extreme example. Your thoughts there, Stan? Well, you kind of covered a, a great deal of material. So uh, to get my brain stimulated, what I want to do is invite everyone for about a short meditation for around 30 seconds, very short, so well, we can clear our mind. Okay. Okay. All right. Begin.
All right, finished. Now there's one sharp phrase that you mentioned that really stands out for me, and that was the freedom of ideals, which links in with creativity. What happens a lot, and we get a lot of messages uh, from particular spiritual teachers that we're in a stage of civilization where we're actually losing a lot of our power. And what I mean by power, we're losing that capacity to create, particularly in terms of ideals. Uh, when we give up our right and our power of freedom of thought, then we become very vulnerable. We lose our direction in life because many people that are probably listening may make questions say, well, what does this material have to do in terms of my daily life, my everyday routine? So as you mentioned, we're influenced by a lot of institutions in our life. Uh, first of all, we learn a lot of our values and beliefs from our family. Then the institution of uh, learning, our schools, universities, and then our particular churches, our religions. So we're influenced by a lot of societal factors. But we have to keep in mind that one of the most important factors of what we call our life as humans is our freedom of thought, our freedom of creativity. Because without that, then we lose our power. And like right now, you can see the results of that in so many ways. We give our politicians and say, okay, you take care of the politics for me. We tell our doctors, okay, you take care of our health for you. These are primary uh, factors of learning that we should have access to. We should not relinquish our power, in other words, to investigate and research in these different matters. When we do that, when we relinquish that, we again, we lose a lot of our power. And this is one of the lessons that many spiritual masters have reminded us that we have a lot of problems because we're losing our power. We're giving over the authority and our freedom to other institutions. Um, but this is such a broad topic. Uh, we can approach it in so many different angles, but I like to kind of focus on that particular phrase of freedom of ideals. Mm -hmm. So we know we have a society and a world that has so many different belief systems. So I think one of our major challenges is that how do we exchange, interact, and communicate, and also give full respect to each other's beliefs. Because there has to be a common ground in which we can work together, we can cooperate together in a societal way, you know, to actually operate a society and, uh, you know, a system of, of operation, laws or whatever. Our culture has to have some kind of cohesive binding to it. But the United States is the perfect example. How many nationalities do we have living here? <laughs> How many different religions do we have living here? It's a bold experiment. And I'm very, I'm, I'm very happy for our country for taking on such a bold experiment. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to comment on that particular, the, the freedom of ideals. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, piggybacking on that, uh, uh, which I think would be a good. Stan, you might have to turn down your uh, volume just a little. Okay. Okay, let's see if we still have that. Okay, I think we got rid of it. Can you still hear me all right? Okay, you're fine, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Seth talks about this, about the, the, the democratic government created in this country is, is still maybe the boldest the boldest thing ever done. And, and it, it, um, in an ideal sense is the, potentially the most equitable for, for all humans. Um, but the, down, the, the tricky side of that is when you think about it, it puts extreme responsibility on each individual because in, in more controlled countries, you don't get to make a lot of choices for yourself. Other people are making them for you. But here we have so many options. I mean, just on the most basic level, what, what career do you, do, that you want to choose and what kind of lifestyle do you want to live? You know, if you want to be single or married, I mean, think about it. There's still countries that really frown on people not being family units because people have more control of you that way. Um, so, you know, the democracy experiment, which is <laughs> having its ups and downs and has forever, though, is, is still the, the boldest way to go. And the one that potentially is still the most the most equitable for everyone. Um, what happens is, though, is still within that we still have the charismatic folks who uh, somehow intuitively understand their own abilities to persuade and influence others as being strong. Uh, other folks may not be as good at thinking for themselves, and then they become vulnerable to being uh, convinced how they should believe. And that's, that's where we get into the realms of 
what can be dangerous. So what I'm trying to get at here with the whole concept of tying this into suffering is that, and, and there are many exercises for doing this, uh, you really have to pay attention to what you think and how that influences what you believe because those beliefs are going to steer how you act on your impulses, impulses leading to the events that you that you create in your daily life. And that because that sets the stage for everything else and everything that you do affects even on a subatomic level. I know it sounds crazy, right? But it's it, it's there's so much evidence that it's true how things ripple through. You know, I gave that extreme example of Hitler, you know, how how one man's thoughts based on his own delusions and his own fears rippled through an entire nation and took hold and a similar thing in Japan. And, you know, we could come up with numerous examples of this happening now. So we're back to the basic idea of Stan said it of creativity and freedom of thought. You have to take responsibility for your own thoughts and your own actions. And the hardest thing to do is to break away from all those layers and layers and layers of what you've been conditioned to believe by others. And you have to move away from that. You have to go inside yourself. And that's quite a process. And without trying to step on toes here, a lot of organized religions don't really want you to do that. They want to tell you what to do and what to believe because it serves their purpose as an organization. Because to me, generally at the root, organized religions are something that, that came out of natural spirituality, regardless of the culture, the time, and history. But when you have a lot of a lot of folks involved in that is is, is something which actually becomes a political organization, there, there becomes a group agenda. See, now we're back to, to creating mass events, right? A, a group agenda which may not serve each individual person in, in, in that group based on their personal needs and, and their personal uh, growth parameters spiritually, yet they become influenced. And a lot of the actions that they may think they're doing that would be better for other people, right? Because now they, in the, in the group psyche, they start to believe what's better for everyone else. And they start to, to, to try to influence and tell people how to believe and, how to act, and here, here we are again, creating more suffering for ourselves. Because in that scenario, we're denying a lot of our own impulses for what's right for us. We're going along with what the group says because we give our individual power over to that group, and now we're caught back in that dynamic again. So that's why I wanted to bring this up. I wanted to try to help folks identify where, 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 where does individual suffering comes from, and how, how does this, how does this lead to? Why nations suffer. And we're back to this whole cycle of giving our power away and not, not as Stan said, not exercising our own freedom and creativity. We have to be bold enough to step out of that matrix and find out for ourselves. Well, if we're, look, if we're looking for a ready formula, I think the task is going to be way beyond our means. It would be easy if we could come up with a you know with a particular formula, you know, that said, okay, you do A, B, C, and then you can you know you can resolve this issue, you can find your freedom. But I look at it in a way that okay, we have these structures that's implemented in society. You know, we have educational systems, we have economic systems, we have spiritual systems by the way of religions and spiritual beliefs. I think we're at a, we have to look at where where we're at at this point in terms of our evolution. Our evolution as humans, our evolution also as spiritual beings. So I think it's important to address where we are at this time. And I think one of the things that I found out about this country, I'm not speaking so much for the entire world, but I see in this country, we don't spend enough time for reflection, contemplation, and meditation. So it's not so much that we should separate from a religion in a physical sense, but we should also, as we learn, within a system, we should also put in a good effort in trying to learn who we are as a spiritual being, as a human being. What is our place? What is our purpose in this life? What do we want to accomplish in this life? Because like what you just mentioned, Ken, it's, you're so influenced by not only the fast pace, but these other institutions that's constantly telling you what to do. So you have to have a time out. You have to, 
the uh, reset button or the pause button, however you want to mention it, and take time to find out who you are. What do you want to accomplish? That's why I think the freedom of thought really comes into play. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's what it's all about, is, is trusting, trusting that, that freedom to think for yourself. And, you know, if you think about it, um, <clears throat> if you just sit quietly every day, uh, which and reflect, which that's what meditation, that's if you look up the dictionary definition, that's what it is. It's it's meditation is is that specifically. It, it's it's deep, it's deep reflection. And if you pay attention, you'll start realizing, you know, that you have impulses. And we've we've often been taught that our the impulses that pop up are that they have an evil root that if oh my goodness if everyone followed their impulses they'd be out shooting everyone and this and that and the other and no because you're 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 wired in a sense to to right away be able to feel the difference between really negative impulses and and positive impulses and you know i mean a positive impulse is something that would benefit you in such a way that you wouldn't cause cause harm to another or make someone else want to cause harm to you right so you can start with noticing what your impulses are. What are what are you drawn to? You know, a, a really uh, practical example will be: let's say you have a person who's sitting there, and they say, uh, "Boy, you know, I know I would make a great musician. I have a lot of talent for that. But boy, you know, I'd make a great teacher too. Hmm. Uh, and, but I could really sell. You know, and and folks, what that is is folks are tapping into these 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 latent talents that they have." But they have a hard time making a decision because inadvertently, most of us have been taught to be careful about following impulses. Oh, they're frivolous. And, um, you know, we, we tend to not trust our, our intuitive selves as much as we trust our rational selves because that's a big part of Western culture. We've been taught that way. So I would say there's a good place to begin tying in with what Stan said to get to know the difference between what's been put into your head and what what you feel intuitively is is what you're most strongly drawn to forgetting what anybody else would think about it you have to get that out of the equation because not following the impulses to find your true nature and who you really are is the root of what begins to make you suffer and we i think we can see what happens is people suffer and they build up layers and layers and layers of suffering and it creates resentments and it creates anger and it creates fear and that's what's dangerous the suffering is dangerous because the suffering is what leads people to following the negative impulses um it's a very it's kind of a double bind and, it, and it's very uh it can become very complex so you really like stan said you really have to spend time going inward there there are numerous sources of of exercises for that process and you don't even necessarily need them if you just sit quietly and and let yourself get very relaxed and see what comes up and uh, I would suggest journaling those things that's a great place to start wouldn't you agree oh um, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and like and I, I said, said uh, I'm getting a little feedback on my end are you getting any feedback from audio I was earlier but when you turned down your speaker volume it went away Okay, okay. I don't mind it if it's on my end. Okay. Uh, okay, what I'm speaking of is that this is where individuality, I think, comes into place. And I think you and I can have this, uh, uh, you know, really represent a good example of that. Because I always praise you for your organizational abilities. And I'm, I'm more of a internal sort of intuitive type. So you just, you have to find what your particular asset is, I think. So it may vary. Sometimes you may be half and half. Sometimes you be maybe more uh, organizational or more objective, that's fine. But as long as you can find your particular balance. So in a way, I think w the wisest qualities of our teachers, if you really observe a good teacher, he not only gives you material, he doesn't just disseminate material, but he guides you. When he guides you, he sort of like lets you go because the experience sometimes is going to be more valuable than the lecture. Bingo. Right, okay. So this is how, when we do these presentations, we just hope that we could guide people in certain directions where they can find their own truth, their own balance, important. Uh, but yeah, you hit, you hit the nail on the head with that in that terms of, you know, our belief systems can cause so much misery, pain and suffering. But sometimes we need to di di differentiate 
pain and suffering because some pain and suffering is actually useful because mm -hmm. it could be a wake up call. It could say, what? why is everything going wrong? And right, so we, it wakes us up until we find the right path. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's the point I want to share at this time. Yeah, that's good. And you know, I'm thinking here, uh, you said a good thing about teaching because we both teach. And one of the interesting things there is, um, and I know we've always said this, and I still have, a, I have a student that's been with me since he was 16 years old. Uh, he just, I think he just turned 50. Okay, this guy's been with me a long time. And when I say student, I'm talking about a martial arts student. And he still is bewildered by the idea that if I'm the so-called authority figure in the class, why I encourage people in the class to, to just take what I say as a springboard and, and as a stimulus for them to take material and work with the material themselves and find their own path. And I, and I suggest to them that the best way to graduate from my class is when they have the uh, extreme aha moment and they realize that it's time to leave my class and do their own thing. And some folks, this one in particular, is somewhat be bewildered by that whole idea, you know. And even my, my reluctance to, to label what we do specifically has always been an issue. I've always purposely played a little trick with my students and changed the name. The, 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 I won't even say the description, but the label, because it's meaningless. You know, Bruce Lee made a huge point about that with his art. He says, how do you put a name, a label on something that's always evolving? Well, we got to have a name. So he finally came up with the name that was really a, a three word description of a concept of of that whole process. Right. So. So, see, we're not sitting here trying to tell you we're going to that we feel like we're the grand authorities and we're going to give you step by step answers. All we're going to try to do is may, is offer you some some ideas and possibly some tools and some avenues for your own investigation. You know, and you don't have to throw out your current uh religion necessarily but i think you need to question any and all organized belief systems and see how that butts up against what your intuitive thoughts and feelings are about what you believe because a lot of times when you do that in an honest way even making a simple list of of uh take any particular subject um and put that at the top of the page and have a Positive beliefs on one side, negative beliefs on the other side. And be very honest when you do this. It's even better to, to, to be, I'll say, in a, in a kind of a light, self-induced hypnotic state, which just means that you've gotten yourself very relaxed and you're in that state of mind, which a lot of would refer to as daydreaming. You know, you're a little below just your normal consciousness because your, your mind has slowed down. And you're in that world that's you're, you still know you're awake, but you're still a little bit dreamy because then you have a little more access to, to answer those questions. Honestly, no matter how negative they seem or how scary, that's just one thing I'm suggesting is a tool to, to begin this process. Uh, what do you think about that, Stan? Well, that, that's a good point. And uh, I want to say one thing. We're not agreeing with each other because we want to compliment because a lot of times we, we disagree. That's <laughs> so right. we, you know, uh, we just want that to be known. This is not framed in any way or scripted in any way. Uh, this is one reason why they do suggest a time for meditation is right before you go to sleep. And also when you wake up in the morning, yeah. the first thing, because your consciousness is in a different state and it's more receptive to get information from, you can, we can call it the horror realm or you can call it the subconscious or the ear or whatever, but it's more susceptible to receiving information that's beyond the physical. Because a lot of time our choices are just what they're made based on what we're experiencing on a physical level. So that in itself is going to limit the results that we really want to get because we're only dealing things on a gross physical level. This is why it's good to go into meditation and particularly at those times when you're rested, okay, when you're ready to go to sleep or when you first get up in the morning. It sort of sets the tone particularly well when you do it when you get up in the morning. But Kim brought up a good point too is that within the structure, no matter what religion you are, there will be people that will tend more to a, what I would call a rigid viewpoint. There will be others that are more medium, and there will be others that's more liberal. It's not always a constant because energy is always fluctuating. The ideal is that you want to avoid the extreme. 
So if someone's viewpoint is very, what you call static, stagnant and rigid, you want to avoid that, okay? The same thing on the other end is someone is sort of so loose that they have no anchor at all. <laughs> so you want to be able to differentiate where you're getting your information at, be very discriminatory. No, that's great. I think that's right on too. Um, you know, I've had this conversation with people before that something similar to what we're doing now and and they'll say, well, wait a minute now, how do I know, how do I phrase this? They'll say something like, uh, well, how can I, you know, how can I trust these beliefs as I, as I discover them or, or more so, oh my gosh, my list of negative beliefs on this particular subject uh, is four times longer than the list of my positive beliefs on this particular subject. Then I would say, well, how do you feel about that? I mean, uh, which feels which feels more true to you? And you have to go there, right? But if you don't like what you believe about something, you do have the power to change it. And because uh, to me, this is this is a primary thing on how you can gain um, your ability to reframe your whole way of seeing everything and how how you influence yourself and others through your daily world based on on your on your beliefs. So what you can do is you can choose to change your beliefs on a particular subject. You simply sit down and make a list on, on uh, a, a more positive beliefs on that particular subject. And you can basically just go into that meditative state and, and strongly visualize changing all those negative thoughts and negative images. Create Some people work better from images. Some people work better from words or a combination of the two. And that has an uh, an energetic effect, not not only on on overly the uh, your your daily life eventually, but uh, it has an effect on the outer world too. Um, you know, uh, we could do four of these just on how this influences your own physical health as well. I mean, uh, you know, the this is coming up even more now in established medical science that they're they're acknowledging now that. You know, a lot of people get diseases and they and they'll sit down and in the interview process they'll realize, boy, these people just are, you know, they're 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 afraid they're gonna get this disease or that disease. And I think by now most of us realize that thinking and how we think has direct effects on our body. It has a direct effect on our body. You know, you see the people that walk around in there. There seems to be no reason why. Why are they sick all the time? But if you start talking to most of those people, which is a little experiment I've tried over the years, listen to what they say, because what they say is coming from their beliefs and their thoughts. They talk themselves into becoming ill. They buy into that model. Some folks have great need to become ill because, as Stan said earlier, that's part of the pain and suffering that you've chosen to experience to get you to go to a better place. Sometimes you have to go through that. Some people have to have, have illnesses and diseases in order to, to stimulate them to, to realize how they've actually created that experience in their lives to stimulate them to go beyond that. So that's just an idea of a process that I really want to make sure I, that, that, that I'm suggesting uh, is a possibility for, for folks to, uh, to help them reframe uh, everything. Uh Yes, and I think it's very important to be aware, again, of your inner feelings, uh, because we have a, a very detrimental habit because we're undergoing so many different uh, stress factors and so many different influences. We sort of repress our own individual feelings. We're not really true to our feelings. We don't really want to accept our feelings, particularly the negative ones, because we want to judge those. But we need to get past judging our own negativity, because that's a part of being a human being. Yes. You're going to make errors, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to make misjudgments, and there's no sin attached to that. Oh, <laughs> it's part that's, of, a big, that's a big one. Yeah. It's part of being simply a human being. Welcome to the human, to the human race. <laughs> that's right. Guilt. The word guilt popped in my mind. And we know a lot of folks have been conditioned because guilt is a great control tool. You know, if, uh, it, it's a great way to... Uh, to kind of keep people in line, you know, is is to 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 make them feel guilty. Uh, I'll I'll leave that alone beyond saying that. But um, yes, you can't you can't it's like Stan said. You, you know, not only not judging yourself for having negative thoughts and negative feelings, but 
don't judge other people for it either, you know, because they're they're going through their own their own realization and their own evolution too. See, and that gets really tricky when you get into the realm of things like, uh, yeah, but you know, my husband was abusive to me, and he used to beat me up, and he used to rape me, and I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on, and this whole negative chain. That pretty tough for the average human being not to uh, want revenge or to really judge that person for it for their acting out of their negative state of mind. But you have to work toward adopting a different view of that. Uh, these things come from ignorance and these things come from fear. You know, people do things like that when they, they, they're very afraid because they don't feel they're in control of their own lives at all. So one of the ways they act out that extreme buildup of that energy is to put it onto other people. However, to be a so-called victim, which I don't believe in that, you have to be willing to participate. The tricky part of that is most people don't consciously know that they're willing to participate. But I, I am a firm believer that no human being can control any other human being on any level if the other one doesn't cooperate. But you have to understand the dynamics of how that works. You have to understand that you're being a willing participant. And this here still ties into this overall conversation about We'll go back to my Hitler example. You know, there were people that chose not to participate in any of that. And even though that was a so-called worldwide war, there are a lot of people who were not directly involved or directly touched because on a soul level, they decided not to participate in that. So that's a big one to think about right there. Uh, yes, because if you're influenced to do something or if you're motivated by fear, that right there is a big caution, a big red light that something is wrong. You should not be motivated by fear and intimidation. What you should do is always act from a state of knowing and a state of love. The reason why I want to mention love, because as a human being, we have two major faculties that we think and we feel. So our actual trajectory in life is to accentuate, to enhance those two qualities, increase our intelligence and also increase our capacity to love. And when I mention love, I'm not thinking in terms of romance and so forth, because that's all distorted. Okay? I'm thinking about a higher love and we can accept one another for who they are. And when that person has difficulty, it could be the most traumatic difficulty. But if they open the door and as Ken say, if they ask for your help because of that love, because of that feeling, you're willing to give that. And this is what I think in society, we, we see a lack of that in different areas. Of uh, Even when you think of the crime, you know, why, what creates criminal behavior? You don't see any psychologists, at least not in the major uh, media outlets, you don't see any professional psychologists, psychiatrists, or sociologists comment on that. It's always the common everyday person. And it's kind of sad because why do we spend money on educating people to specialize in the field and they don't see, we don't see their contribution? So you can kind of ask that question and say, what is going on in our society where we have so many loopholes for these people to need help they don't receive it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. See, and uh, for me, this spins back to the whole idea of, you know, people are suffering and, you know, a lot of them are suffering from their choices and they're suffering from their choices because they're, they have this innate fear. They haven't been taught to, to, to trust their own uh, inner good self and their own impulses toward positive action um, because it's a pattern that gets repeated and repeated and repeated over and over and over again. I mean, on a practical level, you know, you sit there and you think, okay, you, wouldn't you think by now, uh, after the extreme worldwide affecting aspects of war in just the last hundred years alone and so many, so many large scale, how it could even be possible that anyone could be silly enough to think that that accomplishes a damn thing that's positive or that ever gets us out of that loop. The psyche of a large portion of mankind is still stuck in that same loop that of exclusivity of religion, exclusivity of culture, exclusivity of government, and afraid of what's beyond. You know, I have an, uh, a very deep down feeling about just the internet alone, I think is probably the single biggest thing that's happening in, in, in my lifetime that is one of the potential gigantic global 
steps toward the possibility of finally breaking that ridiculous chain because xenophobia, you know, the, the fear of other cultures, mm -hmm. the fear of other people is one of the things that keeps that mentality alive. And I notice more and more now, you see a lot of interesting things pop up like, uh, who are these guys somewhere? I think it's on the East Coast where um, I think I think it's like a Korean taco trucks in a, in a heavily Middle Eastern Muslim neighborhood or something like that. And talk about bringing two very different kinds of cultures together. But you keep seeing more and more examples of those kinds of things. And I, and I noticed just like Facebook alone for all the negative press it's getting right now because of certain habits they have. Okay, there's bound to be funny things that happen. Yeah, however, like I'm connected to people all over the world, as I know you are. And, and you learn so much about other people. And one of the biggest things you learn about other people is they're really no different than you. Even those little cultural affects are different and language is different. And, you know, you even have all these language translator things that are going on when people type in one language and it shows up in English and you type, you know, I mean, if anything can connect people better technologically, I still think this is one of the most amazing thing that's going on. And, and I, I see this as, as one of the things that I think is starting to help break that chain. We're getting less fearful. And yet at the same time, you have microcosmic things like this silly, ridiculous nonsense of we thought we were over this through the 60s and 70s with all the racial stuff in the U.S. And then that flares back up. And, you know, but what allows that? How, how does that happen? It's still because people are still trapped in loops, fear-based, self-suffering loops of beliefs that they don't need. They, it's so ingrained in so many people, they don't even, they don't even know how to think far enough for themselves to realize that because that's stage one if you don't realize you're trapped in a loop like that you can't even possibly begin a process to go beyond it yeah there there is a step uh but well, there's a phrase that I, I learned from a friend who was channeling you know uh the ascended masters she stated that they were emphasizing disengaging from the collective consciousness and what that means is that you take time to dis engage from the information that's coming to you. You're not judging it, either good or bad, negative or positive, but you disengage from that so that you can gain clarity on what direction that you're going. So you want to be able to develop a discernment. You know, if I give you information, if it feels right, if it makes sense, okay, then you may go a little bit, even if you go with a little bit of caution. But a lot of people, like I said, we've given up our freedom of thought and really what happens in terms of those two facilities that we have, thought and feeling, is that your critical thinking starts to diminish. That is incredibly dangerous because that means you can't even discern what's yes. true and what's false. So this is why a lot of people are now saying, be careful with the media. I don't know if we get, we'll get tagged for this, but a lot of propaganda is fed to us to actually make you believe in a certain, in, in a certain way, in a certain direction. That's extremely dangerous when you lose your ability to critically think. There, there you go. And, you know, here we are. Look how much stuff is popping up like, whoo, taking on like wildfire. All the things that have come out of this last school shooting, you know, man, and, and the attacks on the, um, I shouldn't say attacks on the media, but the calling the media out on how they mold things and how they shape things. And, and uh, wow, I mean, it's, it's like at a fervor now that I don't know if I've ever seen before. Um, and what I find really refreshing about that is these groups of high school kids who are at the forefront of a lot of that, and they're boldly standing up and saying, no, we're not going to put up with this because what these, what the so-called people in charge better wake up and realize that most of these kids are just a couple of years away from, from when they, when they're able to vote, some of them within a year, two years. And now there's this there's this huge swelling building of people realizing it's time for a, another paradigm shift away from that old world of thinking and and this sudden over the last few years this sudden lack of journalistic integrity uh, and, and this this very subjective um, picture painting that a lot of these media outlets have done you know. Uh, the news is going it's got, to it's got to go back to uh, there was more integrity, luckily, when we were younger. Uh, and that was called 
here's all the events viewed. We'll put them out there and, and here they are without starting to give their commentary on it and saying the, how their personal feelings, because all that's prejudiced by their beliefs. It's like, no, whatever happens, simple fact reporting, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, here are the people involved. And uh, then it's up to us to make our decision. So I just think there's there's quite an explosion happening right now, and I'm finding this pretty fascinating. And thank goodness, this is coming from younger people. They're the ones that are going to be standing at the plate next, and that's refreshing. I'm very encouraged by that. Well, I believe one of the ancient prophecies, this may be biblical, is that the children will teach the adults. <laughs> so the children that you see now are so much more perceptive. You know, there's a growing population of, you know, high, highly creative, highly intelligent, very perceptive youth. They seem to be, as the old phrase, old soul. Mm -hmm. They've seen it before, they know it, so they're here specifically to start a change. And as you said, the, the paradigm shift is, you know, it's, it's been ready for decades, okay? Uh, but I think we need to be aware too, is as we start to advance, we're gonna be bringing out and exposing a lot of negativity. So I think the more that we start to expose the negativity, we need to be cautious not to be attached to that. Yeah. You see, it's like when you bring up the racism ideal, um, the reason that's easily perpetuated because a lot of fear bashing. Right, right. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, there's a natural sense of people just think about it. Everyone has a degree of prejudice because everyone has an inclination to hang out with the people that they have most in common. That's a, a basic human trait. We're going to have a very small percentage of what you call enlightened people, enlightened humans, who see everyone equal. That may be a good goal for us to, to go for, <laughs> but unfortunately, we're not there yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to be more tolerant and look deeper beyond that. So as you say, yeah, a lot of the youth, they're saying they're not going to put up with this. They can see straight through it. Yeah. They're not going to allow this influence to, you know, to, uh, to take over. So God, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, and you can see the integrity. I mean, I'm, I look at these kids' faces and their body language, and I'm looking real close, and I'm like, I think some of these kids would literally, literally die for the change. If they had, I can just feel it, man. It's like, ooh, there's some supercharged energy here. And, you know, that's we're back to, you know, this stuff swells, and the psyche begins to change, you know. Um, and then on the other hand, you, we still have all this crazy stuff going on about guns. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. You know, oh, I mean, that's just a, I bring it up only because it's, a, it's, it's an extremely interesting big example of how the mass psyche gets influenced by this person or that person. And, and uh Someone, another one of the guys in class right now, who's someone you've known longer than I have, who hasn't been in my class in a long time, and he showed up yesterday, and now he's packing a pistol all the time. And I'm like, well, why are you like, why would you want to do that? Well, the guys out on the street will tell you, you know, it ain't going to be a hand fight anymore. It's not even going to be a knife fight. It's going to be a gun fight. And I said, okay, how many of those have you been in in your life? How many of those have you ever witnessed? Have you ever even looked at just the simple statistics? Of how, actually, how little of, how little of that relatively goes on compared to its inflated um, its inflated image from how media portrays these things? Because um, you know, when you buy into that thinking, now you're part of it and you're helping fan those flames. Because now so and so sees you carrying a gun, so then so and so feels okay to carry a gun. Now you got two guys carrying guns and. What a lot of people don't think about in those situations is, well, you just set yourself up to really draw yourself to a situation where you're going to have to use that gun. You know, on a practical level, if you did get into it with someone, uh, who knows, a fender bender and the guy gets in your face and they, you start shoving each other, all that crazy stuff starts happening and your, your jacket whips open and the guy sees the gun. Well, now he's got, he's even more amped up and he's even more afraid because he sees your gun. So now he's maybe going for your gun. And then all of a sudden this turns into a thing. You pull out the gun to keep him from getting it. And now you, you, a lot of folks would feel like, well, now I have to shoot the guy. See, that's why all that's a bad way to go. It's, it's, uh, you're asking, you're helping create it. You're not helping take it away. And it's very difficult to get people to see how those are so interconnected, those kinds of actions. 
Well, you know, this is what I was referring to as sort of the byproduct of people becoming more positive and making changes within the collective consciousness. In other words, they're making changes in the consciousness, slowly raising the consciousness by their positive thinking. But there's a sort of a purification or cleansing process that's taking place because as you're going through that conscious raising process, you're also revealing a lot of negativity. So those people who have a like mindset, they're going to revert to the fear basis. And what we have to do, and this is, I have to check myself too, is don't use judgment on those. What we have to do, those who are positive, we have to be actually become more positive. For those who are loving, we actually have to become more loving. In other words, we have to go through this phase as quickly as possible by actually enhancing all the positive, positive traits that we have. So with those individuals, you know, as far as I'm concerned, when I encounter them, even though it's challenging, I have to be more positive, more uplifting, more loving. And just like you brought up a good case where you sort of, I don't know if you verbally confronted this person or questioned them, but that's a good act to let them think about, you know, that process. Yeah. You gotta... Yeah. And, and, you, and you don't want to come at it from, a, oh, man, you shouldn't be. You just want to get them into a thought process to let them question themselves why they're doing it. You know, I, I notice if, if you, you know, if you come at somebody with a, you shouldn't be, you know, that kind of a scolding thing, then no, that's, that just, that's like throwing kerosene on the flames. But yeah, you bet, you bet. And that's, I like how you frame that because that's really the truth. Um, you have to make a choice, you know. Um, there was a time not that long ago when I was going to some of the roughest neighborhoods around here in during evictions and, and I'm the guy that's carrying the locks and has to tell our tenants that, well, the sheriff's here because you've ignored months of warnings that you're going to have to leave because your, your rent's not paid. And, you know, if catching myself falling in that fear loop and having a gun and then I, I got caught myself and I'm like, no, if I carry the gun, that's when something's going to happen. If I don't, and I'm not believing that way, then I'm not, I'm not going to bring that on. And you know what? I've been in situations several times since then now, and without having fear of that and everything's always worked out fine you know and that's that's and the reason i'm saying that is <laughs> when you when you make a shift like that in your own consciousness you you're probably going to put yourself in situations where you're testing your own integrity of your shift i'll put it that way because that's what happened to me so uh that's why you got to be real careful what you do <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's there's layers involved. There's yeah. there's uh, different levels involved. So when you, I know if you reflect on how you develop in terms of your learning curve and how you evolved in a sense in this lifetime to where you're at now to be able to do what you're able to do, you look at all the things that you had to go through. You look at all the, the teachers that you've had, uh, the references that you've had that you've drawn from to be where you're at now. So it's important to bring out the fact that everyone is going to have their own life path. So sometimes you can't jump from, from A to C or A to D. Sometimes you have to find your own progression. But what we're hinting on is something that's very important now. Since this energy is shifting, there is a paradigm shift actually in process. There's more positive energy. There's more spiritual energy coming into the earth than there was before. Like this is an exemplary of these youth having such a high intelligence having such clarity, being able to see beyond, you know, the propaganda that they're given. Okay, this is coming from the different energy that's coming in, a higher frequency of energy. So we can just say, and I know Ken would agree with this, find a source, a reference, a learning by which you could accentuate your thought, your thinking process. So you think of meditation as developing the inner calm, the inner peace. So take it a step or further, further a few steps further. How would you be able to project that peace and that calmness to your environment? Because it is capable now. It may not have been that easy, let's say, 100 years ago, but it is capable now. A lot of people are tapping into that energy. But you can start to project that sense of meditation. Uh, I would say the qualities of meditation, peace, calm, compassion, and so forth. It can be projected out. This is why Ken and myself, we found different disciplines, um, the Seth material, myself and universal energy, because that is a direction that they want us to go in now, particularly the teachers that we have. Um, 
They want us to go into that place where we are actually creative in a positive sense, trying to help the whole. And by helping the whole, we also help ourselves. So they're trying to show us this is possible and you want to be headed in that direction. So we can offset what Ken mentioned all about a possible nuclear war or different nations having war, which again is totally destructive. It has no positive benefit at all. Right. And that's wow. a huge example of how how connected we are and how how these the energy of the mass psyche is influencing everything. Um, I, I have something here I'd like to read that fits right in, probably perfectly right about now. Um, this was something that, that Seth had uh, said back in 1979. <clears throat> and uh, I forgot about this until, until I read it in here. And I, and I remember this was something that happened a long time ago. He, he says, there was an enchanting suggestion solemnly repeated many times particularly after the turn of the century. Now, he was talking about between the 1800s and 1900s. And that phrase was, every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. <clears throat> this might sound like a bit of overly optimistic, though maybe delightful nonsense. To, agree, to a degree, however, that suggestion worked for millions of people. It was not a cure-all. It did not help those who believed in the basic untrustworthiness of their own nature. The suggestion was far from a bit of fluff, however, for it could serve, and it did, as a framework about which new beliefs could rally. We often have in, in our society the opposite suggestion, however, given quite regularly, which is that every day in every way I'm growing worse and the world's falling apart. You have meditations for disaster be uh, beliefs that invite private and mass tragedies, and they're usually marked by the polite clothing of conventional acceptance. So many thousands might die in a particular battle of a war, for example, but and those deaths are accepted as a matter of course. These are victims of war without question. It seldom occurs to anyone that these are victims of beliefs since the guns are quite real and the bombs and the combat. The enemy's obvious, his intentions are evil. Wars are basically examples of mass suicide. Embarked upon, however, with all of the battle's paraphernalia carried out through mass suggestion and through the nation's greatest resources by men who are convinced that the universe is unsafe, that the self cannot be trusted, and that strangers are always hostile. You take it for granted that the species is, uh, is aggressively combative. And these kinds of paranoiac tendencies are largely hidden beneath man's nationalistic banners. I'll stop right there. That's a lot right there. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what they call a mouthful right there, because you, <laughs> you can chew on that for a while. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think another uh, fundamental is that as we're going through this shift, uh, we have to accept personal changes that we may experience. Of uh, you know, I have one teacher that says sometimes you may wake up in the morning and for some reason you may be very fearful or you may be very angry. What that means is that not so much that it's coming from your own psyche, from yourself, but because you got to remember being seven, the condition being seven billion people. So if you think of a thought being like you know energy transmission, a thought wave, and you have seven billion antennas on this planet this time <laughs> and you know the majority of them are sending out negative vibrations it's not positive so sometimes we have these mood shifts and they're not coming from us so we need to like i said to separate or disengage and that's, we go back to the non-judgment <laughs> that's a big one I'm glad you said that because that's what this is all about you know that's what that's part of what was just described you know and he brought up nationalism and you know nationalism is uh it's like a lot of folks don't seem to be able to understand the notion of, yeah, you know, you can love your country, but don't love it to such an extent that you think that it's better than all the other ones. You know, I, I always, I look around and I see all these flagpoles in people's yards and stuff. And typically, what do you see? You'll see the American flag and you might see a state flag. And then you might see something like an Irish flag because they're Irish or whatever. But you know what you don't see, and I've said this for decades, and I may have to do this just to get just to get people to think, why not throw a United Nations flag up there? 
you know, because that let, let's think about that. You know, I mean, it, it's okay to be nationalistic to a degree, but we have to think in terms of of the global village and the the global nation. And you know, it's like countries are states of the world, just like Missouri is a state of the U.S. And and you know, this was something that was really big back in the seventies. Um, uh, there was an organization called the United World Federalists. I don't know if you remember that, Stan, but when we were in college, this was this was a big deal. In fact, I was shocked to find out with that when Ronald Reagan, you know, earlier on in his political uh, life, was was a member. You know, that shocked me. I was surprised because later on, as he became, pre- I, it, it didn't seem to fit. But at one point, he understood. It's like, yeah, well, that's the kind of thinking we have to have is we're all one, we're one country, we're one world, we're not just this country. And, you know, it's a part of the shift that needs to occur. Yeah. And like I said, we're going through sort of a sort of a painful birth right now, of what you would call a new age or a paradigm shift. So again, you know, we shouldn't be surprised when the most extremists come forward because they're being revealed, in other words, to be changed, to be transformed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and an interesting thing some of the spiritual teachers say, if they refuse to be transformed, if they cling to that negative thought, then they will, they will create another negative environment in another place, maybe even another planet, perhaps. But some people also refer to what we're going through as an ascension. That means a return to our original state, which means where we were not, you know, operating from fear or from greed or for the sense of gaining power. We operated from a sense of full intelligence and full loving. In other words, when I look at you, I see myself. When you look at me, you see yourself. We're one. That's what the collective conscious should operate. You know, what I gain, you gain. So we should share in that respect. This is why I hope this conversation that we're having, these sessions, bring that, they bring that tone across. In other words, even if we have opposing ideas, we try to shift through it. And if we shift into it decisively, we always find a common core, a common bond, even though it looks like we're coming from opposites, right? Mm-hmm. But in the world we see now, if we're coming from opposite ends, oh my God, we become enemies. <laughs> we conflict, we automatically want to compete. No, we're supposed to be limited. We're human. How on earth can I see everything the way it is? How could you be in one or seven billion people know any topic 100%? Our innate position is that we're limited. So when we engage in conversation, we should seek to fulfill, to enhance our knowledge. That's what that exchange should, you know, should be. That should be the objective of that. So that's the tone that I like, hopefully, that we get across when we have these sessions to other people. Um, and later on, perhaps, we'll have callers come in and they may actually want to join in. And share. Well, you, you just read my mind on that. That was, that was the next thing I was going to mention. That, uh, we'll, we'll get the word out. Um, in fact, you know what we could do is uh, we could even uh, I think we've been we've been trying to keep this right at about 30 days. I think we're a little past that. But, uh, you know, if you want to, we could even tell folks now we could pick the next one and then they'll kind of be ready for it if they want to if they want to join us. You know, um, are you pretty comfortable with that idea? Maybe just going out uh, a month from now, I can give you an idea of dates. Do you have a calendar? Of. Uh- yeah, but my, my instincts is telling me, let's do a third one and let's sort of like solidify our own format. And then, yeah, then let's let's go in that direction. Yeah, so we'll do one more like this and then we'll... Yeah. That's yeah. fine. Yeah, that sounds good. That's a good idea. Okay, that's great. Um, looks like we're, we're about in an hour now. Uh, so uh, anything else, anything you want to close with? Uh, not... Exactly. But I think, you know, this topic is, is so broad that if you want to pick up uh, what we left off in the next one, that's fine. We can stay on the same topic. I think that's that's fine, too. We can expand and, you know. Yeah, because it's pretty broad anyway, because uh, because I, I think t- that's what made me think about doing it this way, because. You know, the, the root of of what keeps people locked in these cycles that are negative for them and other people is it's back to what they believe and it's back to their fear and, and they suffer. They're, they're, they suffer because they're afraid and, and they're afraid because of what they believe and all the conditioning that goes with it. So, and I think just about anything else and everything else is always comes back to being connected to that one way or another. So 
yeah, sure. That's what we can do that. So um, I guess we can uh, officially end this and I'll stay on with you for a minute if you want to. Uh, so we can wrap up our, ourselves and um, well, uh, should we uh, just to kind of let people know that might want to watch us live. Are you comfortable with just shooting out to the last Sunday in April to make it simple? Or is that okay for you to do? Or is that tough to do at this point? Oh, uh, no, uh, that's no problem at all. You know, I kind of leave that up to you. The only issue that I had today, which is my fault, because I take blame for us being an hour late, is that we have another world meditation at 10. I forgot yeah. about that. So I was doing that. Oh, <laughs> Connected to 11. No problem. No problem. I, I forgot it was every Sunday. Yeah, sorry about that. Well, yeah, we'll make it 11 a.m. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, actually, yeah, to make it simple, let's just let's just do the end of April. Yeah, the last Sunday in April. So people okay, know. Okay, I'll, uh, I'm gonna, we'll end the broadcast now, folks. So hopefully uh, when we get this up on Facebook and those of you that have uh, watched the last one, um, will come on board and uh, shoot us some comments. And uh, um, then uh, eventually uh, we can have some of you join us. Stan, I think I mentioned that there's a, a, a lady in Germany, a Persian lady who's uh, a Hugh person. Uh, her name is, uh, I don't, gosh, I don't know if I can pronounce her name right. Shaila and her last name is Ashfar or Asfar. Um, I think she'll be interested. Um, she's she watched the last one and made comments. And uh, as I said, she's she's a Hugh member too. And um, so now she knows who you are, which is a good thing. Uh, so uh, I, I, maybe we can count on her being there <laughs> as one. I'm yeah, sure you know, you'll. I think it was it happened because I did upload the first session on my Facebook. So maybe that's how she got connected i don't know yeah it's been very interesting yeah it's back to the interconnectedness thing <laughs> okay. well. i'll end the broadcast and then we can hang out for a minute okay all right